Well, it's good to, get, good to be back. I'm going to say it's good to be back home because this feels like home, uh, just being with you guys. And uh, I don't know, Pastor Michael, when, I, when you're talking about uh, the names of churches, I always was like in San Francisco, I would say, yeah, our church is so-so. Church is like so-so, like it's so-so. I mean, no, it's so-so. They're like bozo. I'm like, no, but it's like, man, I should have went with like Grace Tabernacle or something like that. Uh, but anyway, I, I bring greetings on behalf of our family in Nashville, uh, Tennessee. We, we actually live in Nashville now, and uh, we're serving uh, churches, a lot of different churches all over the, uh, the U.S., and uh, we work with an organization, ARC, uh, to help plant churches as well, training church planters. We'll, we'll probably plant another 50 or 60 churches this year, and so I get the honor to get to do that, to get to, uh, to just really walk alongside other church planters. I know this, it's a lot easier to coach someone in planting a church and actually doing it yourself. How many of you found that to be, it's easy to tell people what to do? Like it's easy when you don't have kids to tell other parents how they should handle their kids. <laughs> then you have kids, right? Um, but it is an honor. I, I, I feel like God is just in a, a strange, unique way navigated my life and got me to the place where I'm at now. And, uh, and it's really bringing me such joy and honor to get to come alongside other great churches. I'm a local church guy. I love the local church. And uh, anytime I get to be a part of a, a room like this, it's really special for me because the, here's the reality. I want you to listen to this. The reality is, is that in every local congregation, there's really three categories of people. There is the crowd. That's the people that will show up tomorrow. It's the crowd. It's, it's the people that maybe are coming for the first time. Uh, maybe they're, you know, they, they call this church their home. Uh, they, 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 maybe they come two out of four Sundays a month, maybe, maybe even every single Sunday. But they're, they're really, they're the crowd. They're not, what I, they're, they're not what I would call key stakeholders. You know, a key stakeholder is somebody, it, they, they are invested. But they're part of the crowd. But then, then there's a second group, even within that crowd, that's part of the community. These are people that are committed. They're, they're part of like the Acts 2, 42 through 47 community of the church. And they are invested more than just a crowd where they're just observing and coming and checking off a spiritual box. They're part of the community, so they're probably in small groups. And they're probably even part of maybe, maybe a team. Uh, but they show up, and they know people, and they're known, right? They're, they're, they're not just in a room on Sunday with a bunch of familiar strangers, right? It's like, that was a, like, you guys are a tough crowd. I was hoping for like a little giggle there, a little giggle. Um, but, but, but you go from crowd to community, and then there's what, what I call the core, and that's, that's what this is. Um, I don't know much about working out, as you can probably tell, um, but um, again, tough crowd. Um, <laughs> I'm here all day, people, and tomorrow. Uh, but... But I hurt my, I'm getting older, I'm 41 years old, okay? I'm getting a little bit older. And um, some, of you, some of you, when I said that, you're like, you're not old. And others, you, others, others of you are like, geez, you're that old? You know, it's, can't please anybody these days. Um, but I, I, I injured my, my L5 uh, in my back last year, and it was some of the worst pain I've ever had in my life. I'm like, it, having a child cannot be this painful. This is, and, and my wife's like, really, Jason? Really? You got a little L5 there? I, I have like, all my vertebrae came out of my body whenever I had the child, okay? She's like, shut your mouth. But I go to PT, and I go to PT, and I'm, I'm talking to this guy, and I'm like, walk in like this, you know, and uh, he do, starts doing all his voodoo stuff that he does all over, you know, and, and uh, he goes, you know what your problem is? I said, what? He was like, you, you're serious. You work out like every day? I was like, not every day, four to five days a week. He was like, you know what your problem is? I said, I, I know. I'm probably not strong like I used to be because I'm getting older, right? He goes, no, your problem is, the problem with your body is your core. And he said this to me. I'll never forget this. He says, your body is only as strong as your core. And he was like, if you don't have a strong core, he was like, your body becomes vulnerable, and uh, he was like, let me guess this. You probably do bench press. You probably do curls. You know, some of you fellas are the curls for the girls. You know, you, you do. So he was like, I, I bet there's two things you don't do. And I said, what? He goes, we know you don't do legs. You have bird legs. <laughs> he said, number two, I had my shirt off. He's like, number two, I know that you don't do crunches. <laughs> he was like, you have a weak core. And he was like, your body's vulnerable because your core is weak. And I think about that because thank God for the crowd. Thank God for the people that will show up tomorrow. We're here to reach people. Thank God for those folks. Thank God for the community. But can I tell you this? I'm so grateful for pastors and for leaders that want to invest in the core 
because the body is only as strong as the core. And if this room right here is not strong, if you're not at a place of rhythm and rest like Nate talked about, if you're not at a place of health, emotional health, spiritual well-being, if you're not flourishing, if you're not being poured into as much as you're pouring out, then the body, the crowd becomes vulnerable and, and the, church, you know, the church is referred to as the body of Christ. The body is only as strong as the core. And so continue to prioritize strengthening the core collectively as a whole, but also individually. Your spiritual core. What is your spiritual core as an individual? It's your intimacy with Christ. You know, you, 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 can't let intima- you can't let activity for God replace intimacy with God. It's a great spot for it, amen. Right? Don't let your activity for God replace your intimacy with God. Keep the core strong. Stay, keep, the Bible says to, to keep your fervor for the Lord. Keep, keep, keep it fanning that flame. Keep, keep, keep the core strong and healthy. And I'm telling you, so goes the core, so goes the body. What I know about Soma Church is that God is pouring out his blessing on this church. God is expanding your influence. God is enlarging your territory. There, there, are, there, are, there are more services, unfortunately, that, that are going to have to happen, right, until we get a bigger space. And that will happen, too. There will be more locations, the church will grow. Uh, we will reach more people. There will be more people discipled. There are greater sermons to be preached. Not that the previous ones were not good. Those were good. But there are greater sermons to be preached. There are greater songs to be written. There are more altars to be filled. There are more marriages to be restored. There's more prodigals to come home. Listen to me. God's blessing is on your church. And so goes the core. So goes the body. Let's keep getting strong. Amen. And that was just my, uh, my warm-up here, okay? It was like, you got to do your stretches. Everybody do a little stretch right there. Just, that, was, that was a little stretch sermon right there. Okay, we're going to get into the good stuff here in a moment. Um, if you have your Bibles, go with me. They're not going to have this particular text on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, um, go to Matthew chapter 25. I am not going to um, exegete this text. Like, I'm not going to break this text down and teach and do a deep dive into this. Tomorrow will be more of that. Tomorrow will be, I'm going to take Mark chapter 8. I think you guys are in a, a, a series of teachings on the book of Mark. And I've never taught on this, these two verses before in my life. This is not a canned message that I have tomorrow. Uh, Pastor Michael said, here's the verse that I want you to, to tackle. And, and I began to re- read that verse this past week and begin to pray about it. And I just felt like the Lord began to just kind of speak to me. And tomorrow's going to be one of those. This, tomorrow's going to be not an easy sermon. Let me just go ahead and warn you, Okay. It's going to be one of those like, wow, okay, great. I'm leaving encouraged today, you know. (laughs) I'm going to do my best to build you up. But I do think that God's going to speak to us because it's from his word. And we'll exegete the text. But today, I want to use Matthew 25 just to kind of set a framework uh, for just some really practical stuff I want to talk about today. Uh, But as Pastor Michael said, kind of my background in ministry is this, is I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were Assemblies of God church planters and uh, pastors. And so... We lived all over the southeast. My parents planted churches all over the southeast. And uh, before that, before I was born, my parents were missionaries in India. And they did some work in South America, uh, a little bit of work in Africa. My mom still to this day, my my dad's gone on to be with Jesus, but my mom still today, 74, 75 years old, uh, and she still travels all over the world. She was actually hosting an intercessory prayer gathering uh, down at the border of Mexico this week. Okay, 75. I'm like, Mom. I don't know who El Chapo is or any of those people, but like there's, there's cartels down there that will kill you. So please come home safely. She's like, the Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. I'm like, okay, you're going to go see Jesus here soon if you're not careful. But that's my mom. She's just reckless abandoned. She's like, there's no such thing as retirement. She's one of those kind of people, you know. She's like, we don't retire, we refire. I'm like, what? Who says that? Some of you are like writing that down. I'm going to steal that. Um, But uh, I don't know where I was going with that. Oh, anyway, my parents were pastors and church managers, so I grew up in church. I mean, I've grown up my, I'm 41 years old. For 41 years, I've been in environments like this. I would fall asleep underneath the pews at our, my parents' church, go to sleep when my dad was preaching. And one time my dad, this is, this is not healthy right here at all. Uh, I had to go to counseling for this one. But my dad spanked me in front of the whole church. Can you believe that? Like, who does that? It's like. Wow, okay, that's intense. I'm still in counseling for that. I was a, I'm a church kid to the max, PK, and they say PKs are the worst. You ever heard people say that? Preacher's kids are the worst. Well, I grew up in a Christian home, but my dad, I think I maybe have talked about this a little bit here before, but my dad really, 
You know, he, he never dealt with a lot of things from his past. And if you don't deal with your past, eventually your past will deal with you, especially if you're in ministry, not just for those in ministry, in business and whatever, but as life, the pace and the pressure of life picks up, what's in you is, is eventually going to come out. It's just going to. And so my dad really began to just unravel at the seams and became physically and verbally abusive when I was in my uh, young teen years. And um, uh, then he began to have multiple affairs with different uh, women from the church and uh, would, would have an affair, would be removed from the, the pastorate position. Uh, our family would be broken for a bit, get back together, go through counseling, get back in ministry. And this happened seven times. It was in seven different churches. And that was sort of my, my spiritual family of origin, seeing that type of dysfunction, not just at home, but also within the church. And so as you can imagine, I just began to really, man, I really began to not trust church, uh, not trust my, my father, uh, even to the point where my mom was just trying to work out our family and just wanted to hold the family together. But I didn't see it like that. I just saw it as you just keep going back to this person that is destroying our family. So I began to be bitter and resentful towards my dad, bitter and resentful towards my mom, and ultimately bitter and resentful towards God. And there was a lot of emotional brokenness and baggage in my life. And... Um, and our, our family fell apart. I, I lived with my football coach for a period of time. My mom was in a battered women's shelter because my dad began to become physically abusive to our family. And it was at that point that I just was like, you know what? I don't want anything to do with God or church. Like this whole thing is a house of cards. It's a sham. It's just fake. It's just if God will allow somebody like that to be in ministry, then I want nothing to do with this. And so at about 15 years old, I just began to, to run from the Lord. I tell people now looking back, and some of you may find this humorous, some of you maybe not, but I, I had a season where I was developing my testimony. That's what I tell people. <laughs> it's like from 15 to like 18 or so, uh, I just, man, I, my life began to fall apart. And, um, and I was a very broken, confused young man. And then at 18 years old, I, get, I gave my life to Jesus. I was like, all right, I'm done. I, I cannot keep running from God. Like, I can't outrun his grace and mercy. Like, I'm trying. I'm, I'm in the middle of clubs and parties, and I, some random person walk up to me and, sh like, share a scripture with me. I'm like, I cannot get away from God. Literally, I was in New Orleans, and I walk into a bar just to use the restroom, and I th what I think was a bar, and it was a church service. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. I'm like, okay, God, I get the picture. Okay, I'm coming home. <laughs> and, uh, but at 18, I really surrendered my life to the Lord. And I remember being on the front row at, um, at the church that my, my buddy over here, Cole, is one of my, my dearest friends. He's traveling with me. He was actually in my youth ministry a long time ago. And he's still saved. So I think that uh, I have <laughs> decent theology. Um, but he's traveling with me, and he's one of my, one of my close friends. We do some, some work and church kind of kingdom stuff together. But um, it was a youth ministry that he grew up in. I actually grew up in that same youth ministry in Louisiana. And I remember sitting on the front row, and, uh, and a guy from the Republic of Chile who had planted a church, he started just sharing his testimony, and I could not stop crying. It was like, I just, it was like the floodgates could not stop crying. And all I could hear was like, I felt like the Lord said, I want you to, to devote the rest of your life to just loving and serving people in my kingdom. I, I just want you to give your life to just, just building the kingdom and serving in the local church. And that was sort of my first real revelation that God's called me to ministry. I didn't know what that looked like. Um, and, and later it became more of a revelation even there that God said, I'm called you to, to plant churches and to build leaders and to inspire people. That's what it felt like he said to me. Plant churches, build leaders, inspire, inspire people. And I, I look at the girl sitting next to me, this beautiful brunette, and, uh, and she was my girlfriend at the time. And I, I looked at her, and I'm crying. She's crying. I said, I think God just called me to plant churches. And she said, I think God just called me to do missions. So I put my arm around her. I said, girl, let's plant churches and do missions together. <laughs> and that's my wife today. And we were 18. And uh, so we've been married now for a long time, a long time, long, uh, amazing time, 18 years. And, uh, but but I, I responded to the call right then and said, I want to spend the rest of my life doing this. And so I went up to my youth pastor and I told him that I felt called to, to, to maybe plant churches one day, didn't know what that meant, uh, wanted to build leaders. But I said, what is my next step? And he said this, if you're called to plant churches, plant yourself in this church and serve the vision of this house and be faithful. And if, if God has called you to plant churches or whatever he's called you to do, he will be faithful 
as you were faithful. He said, just start serving where you're at. And so I was like, where do I sign up? And so I started serving as a volunteer. And I did that for the next, gosh, probably three, four years, just served as a volunteer and began to see that, man, there's more to what I feel God's called me to do. And then I became a youth pastor and a young adult pastor and an executive pastor and one of the teaching pastors at that particular church for over a decade, I think 13 years. And then went to a church called Gateway Church in Dallas, Texas, and just said, hey, whatever you need me to do, I'm here to serve. Uh, God's called me to plant churches. That may happen one day, but for now, I'm called to serve the vision of this house. And uh, just began to serve there. And then eventually became the executive pastor there, overseeing all their family ministries, like next generation stuff. And then finally, after, I don't even know, almost 20 years of just saying yes to whatever God asked me to do, finally, Pastor Robert and the elders said, we think it's time for you to plant, plant a church. And I was like, this has been like 20 years in the making. And, and I was so excited about that. And they sent us to plant a church, and we planted a church in San Francisco with a group of friends in 2017, saw God do some miraculous things, and then began to sense in 2021 that the Lord was calling us to, to help plant churches, plural, not just plant and pioneer a church, but plant churches and build leaders, and so we begin to shift into a new season to do what we're doing now. But here's why I tell you all of that. There's been 23 years now of ministry, and in every single space, volunteer, uh, every layer, layer or level of leadership, from, from, from mopping and picking up and cleaning in facilities, to being a lead pastor of a church, to coming alongside other lead pastors now, in every space, from serving to sidecar, where I'm at now, this passage of scripture has sort of been a bit of a North Star for me. Uh, it's very practical, um, the way that I, I'm going to unpack this. But Matthew 25 gives these five words that have sort of been branded in my, my mind and in my heart. And I just want to deposit them uh, into you today. Uh, here's, here's the passage of scripture. It's familiar to probably most of you, but it says this. Again, it will be like a man on a journey who called the servants. Uh, sorry, this is in verse 14. Chapter 25 of Matthew. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, uh, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Underline that, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work, and he gained five bags more. So he doubled it. So also the one with the two bags of gold gained two more. Uh, but the man who had received one bag, he went off, dug a hole in the ground, uh, and he hid his master's money. Probably hid it in uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, <laughs> wasn't in my notes. just happened. <laughs> After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold? See, I have gained five more. His master replied, here's the five words, well done, good, well, I didn't count, and, well done, good, and faithful servant. Well done, good, faithful servant. Well done, good, faithful servant. Well done, good, faithful servant. Hmm. He says, you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. It's interesting, him being entrusted with this and stewarding the opportunity well, he's not given just greater compensation, he's given greater responsibility. He goes on and says, uh, come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good, faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, look at, just listen to his, his posture towards uh, his master. He says, I knew that you were a hard man. Who told him that? I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. It's interesting. He victimizes himself. He's blame casting. He's making excuses and he's being led by fear. And his response or the response of his master is, is, is these four words. You wicked, lazy servant. You wicked, lazy servant. The text continues to go on. That feels like a backhand, doesn't it? You wicked, lazy, wow, servant, you know. It, it feels very sharp and blunt. 
but I think this contrast between the two things that are said about each one of these uh, servant leaders is pretty profound. It goes on and it shows the discipline that the master gives. But remember, this is a parable. This is, this is not something real that happened, but it, it gives us kingdom principles. And, um, and the five things that I, I really felt like I wanted to share with you today are these five words that were said about, about the first two that I've always, for 23 years, I've, I've desired deeply to have these five words said about me. Not just by Jesus. Like, we know that we're going to stand before God in heaven, and, and we're going to hear, hear, well done, good, faithful servant. Why? Not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. Why? Because we are saved by grace through faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Period. It's, it's solo gratia. It's grace alone. It's, it's only Jesus. If, listen, it, it cannot be because of our works that we get to heaven. It cannot be because of anything we've merited or done. It doesn't matter what you've done or undone. It, none of that is going to get you in before God and have him say, hey, welcome into this place. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Period. That's it, right? We settle that. That's salvation. But I think there's, there's these five words that I've always thought I would love to hear these five things said about me by the person that oversees me, my boss, my leader, my pastor, my overseers, my board of directors. I, I want when people think about my leadership, I want them to say these five things about me. Well done, good, faithful servant. Each one of those words I want to take as sort of a, a launching board uh, to unpack just five different thoughts for you. But say this with me. Say well. well. Say it like you mean it. Well, well. done. done. Good, good, faithful, faithful servant. servant. Come on, one more time. Well, well done, done, good, good faithful, faithful servant. Now, now just hear these words. You wicked, lazy servant. No one wants to hear that, right? Like, don't say that to your spouse when they don't take the trash out. Like, just don't do that. It's not going to work out good for you. Well done, good, faithful servant. Take a note. So we're going to put some of this on the screen. Here's the first one. Well, what does that mean? When I think of the word well, I think of, I think of this phrase. Everything we do. We do with excellence. We need to do it well. As a leader in the church, as a leader in, the, in your organization, as a leader, maybe if you're in education, whatever space you find yourself occupying as a servant leader in the kingdom of God, representing the kingdom of God both in this house and outside of this house, everything that you do as a child of God and as a servant leader, you got to do it well. You got to do it as best as you possibly can. You got to do it with a spirit of excellence. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says this, whatever, whatever you do, not just if you preach, not just if you're in the kids' ministry, whatever you do, you're a teacher, you're a lawyer, you're a banker, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as unto the Lord. You know what it's saying? It's saying whatever you find in your hands, you got to see that it's a stewardship, and you say, I'm going to do the very best that I possibly can with what I have. Listen, perf excellence is not perfection, okay? Let me be clear. Excellence is doing the very best with what God has entrusted to you. Excellence in your finances is doing the very best with what God has given you. Excellence with this building right here, you may be semi-portable or whatever, but I would say this is an excellent environment because this, you don't have a permanent space. It's your home to call your own yet in Jesus' name, but you have this space and this is what's been given to you. And so you say, we're going to make sure we do everything well. We're going to do it well. We're going to do it with a spirit of excellence. Excellence at every single level. I wrote some of these down years ago. And this is just, I'm going to say in the church, the bathrooms. Every single bathroom needs to have a spirit of excellence. As funny as that sounds. Like, have you ever walked into that bathroom? I'll just talk to the men. You ever walked into the bathroom? You go to wash your hands at the sink, and you're right there, and then you look up in the mirror, and you have water all on the front of your, like, here, and you're like, why was that not wiped up? You know, I've taught my sons, when we go into a bathroom, I don't care if it's at an airport, I don't care if it's at a church, at a restaurant, if there's napkins everywhere, I know it's someone else's job, but right now we're in this space, we're going to clean up, we're going to pick up. Now, I don't go scrubbing toilets and stuff like that. I ain't doing all that. <laughs> I don't feel that second mile anointing on me, but the first mile, I can clean up at the sink. <clears throat> but excellence. Man, you walk into a bathroom, every single space, man, clean, smells fresh, trash, cords. I, man, I go to some churches, I'll see cords all over. Where's the worship team at? The production. I'll see cords everywhere. It's like, man, gaff tape covers a multitude of sins, amen, from the production team. Like, let's just, let's keep it clean. I've been in churches before, and they have light bulbs out, and I come back three weeks later, same light bulbs are out. I'm like, man, do you think that that's 
an excellent spirit? I'm like, it's not. We got to have an excellent spirit. Excellence in production and hosting and greeting, guest experience on Sundays, our print materials. I remember one time I walked in uh, at Gateway and uh, I walked in these, these precious volunteers. They're like high school students in there. Man, they, they were cutting some printed materials and uh, like handouts or something. And man, this one kid, he had his eyes on this girl. He was scoping and hoping, boy. I mean, he was trying to get her number and he's just cutting, you know, the, the little cutter. He's just cutting all this paper. And man, the edges were like this all over the place. And I looked at that. I said, bro, you need to go ahead and get her number, but you need to give me this stuff. You have lost your job because this is not excellent. But we want to have excellence in everything that we do. You know why? Let me tell you why. Because excellence communicates a message to guests when they come into Soma Church. You know what it communicates? We've been waiting for you. It communicates value. You're so important that we thought about the details. I, I care about this. Why? I think, I think churches should be the most excellent environments that you step into and you walk into. Why is it that, that great hotels get this, great restaurants get this, and they, have, they, they are doing something, thank God for their service, but it is not about seeing people's lives transformed and changed. The church should have the most excellent presentation because we have the most excellent message of grace that's found in Jesus Christ. And so we give it our very best. I think that when people are showing up at churches and people are still setting up and scrambling around, it communicates a message that you weren't important enough for us to get here early enough to make sure the table was set for you to come to the Lord. I think it communicates a beautiful message when you do the opposite. I think about, um, I think about Daniel, Daniel chapter one. I love Daniel chapter one. Uh, it talks about how King, King Nebuchadnezzar, I think it was King Nebuchadnezzar said that these, these, these boys, it was four guys, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he said that they're 10 times better than the rest of the servants that are here. And he says this about Daniel, he has an excellent spirit. Notice, excellence is not something that you do. It's actually who you are. It permeates when you have an excellent spirit that, that everything you do, you see as I'm going to give my very best. It permeates into everything, even how tidy your car is. Hello, preach that. It permeates into everything when you have an excellent spirit. You got to have an excellent spirit. I love 1 Kings chapter 10. It says the queen of Sheba, she heard this reputation about King Solomon's palace that he had built. And so she said, I got to go see this palace that the king has built for myself because people are ranting and raving about how amazing it is. So she shows up and the scripture tells us in 1 Kings 10, when she walks in to the king's palace and she sees the excellence of the table and how the feast has been set up, how everything is organized and every detail is laid out. And she begins to see the excellence of the servants, how they're serving and hosting the guest experience. As she stood there, the scripture says it, it took her breath away. It was a breathtaking experience when she walked in. She said, truly, the half was not even told about what the king has built. Man, wouldn't it be great if people would hear a reputation about Soma Church? That they go, I got to go see this for myself. And they walk in, and it's a breathtaking experience, and it exceeds everything they could have ever imagined. You know one of the things that does it? Yes, the presence of God. Yes, the preaching of the word of God. But I can tell you this. When we create an excellent environment, it makes people walk in and go, wow, these people Man, they do things at a whole nother level. They must really care about their mission and cause. Excellence. I love this, and I'll move to the next thing. Uh, Eames, you know Eames, the uh, beautiful chair? It's like the mid-century modern chair. It costs like $8,000 for this chair. I have a fake one because I would never pay that. Uh, but I have this fake Eames chair in my office, and I saw an interview one time. They asked uh, Eames, they said, man, we're looking at, at, at the, the, the details uh, of this chair. Can you explain the details uh, of the design in this chair. And he looks at them and he says, what do you mean? They said, well, there's so many details. Tell us about the details of the design. And this is what he said, the details are the design. You know what he's saying? It's the little things that make a big difference. It's the small things that actually go a very long way. And they actually, that's part of the design and it's excellence. Colossians chapter three in uh, the message translation, I think it is, it says, servants, do what you're told by your earthly masters and don't just do the minimum that will get you by. Do your best. That's excellence. Work from the heart for, real, for your real master, for God, confident that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. Look at this. The sullen servant who does shoddy work will be held responsible. This, this line right here just is amazing. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Isn't that great? I love Eugene Peterson. Here's the application. 
whatever area you're serving in here at church or in your office, at your workplace, you want to you wanna pursue excellence because I think excellence is not about perfection. It's about pursuit. You're pursuing every day. I want to get a little bit better every single day. Create a feedback loop. Say this to yourself. Say, feedback is my friend. Feedback is my friend. I, get, I have a feedback loop with my wife, with my, uh, my, my uh, co-founder for my company, uh, with mentors in my life, and I, I ask them this question. Here's, I'm going to give this to you for free. It wasn't in my notes. Ask them, say, um, as a leader, as you watch me as a leader, scale from 1 to 10, remove the 7. That's a neutral number, right? It's neither good nor bad. Everybody always says 7 because it's, it's neither good nor bad. So just remove it. Scale from 1 to 10, remove the 7. How do you think I'm doing as a leader? 1, terrible, I should quit. 10, I'm crushing it. And if they say 8, here's all you got to say. What's costing me the two points? Because I want to get better. You can do that after, you get finished, after I get finished speaking. I could, I could ask Cole. Cole, I just got up and I communicated. You know the notes that I had. Scale from 1 to 10, remove the 7. How do you feel like I did? 1, bombed 10. Man, it really was helpful. And if he says 6, he's fired, okay? I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't pay him. I don't pay him. Awesome. Uh, let, me keep, let me keep moving. Here's a second one. I took too much time on that, but I'm passionate about it. Well done. Somebody say done. done. See, this is, what, this is what that means to me. Everything that we start, we always finish. I've always made this a commitment in my life. I'm like, if I start something, I need to finish it. Uh, let me just go ahead and say this. I started uh, pursuing some stuff in, in theology school years ago, and I just got so caught up in ministry stuff, I didn't finish it. And it's always bothered me. So uh, I got on a phone call last week with a university, and I'm going to start working on the rest of my theology degree. Why? Because I, I don't want to just sell this. I've got to smoke what I'm selling, right? <laughs> I've got to practice what I preach, right? Because it's always been, look, you guys are humorous and funny. Look at you. I'm so proud of you. Gosh. But everything we start, we finish. And this is an important leadership trait. And for some of you in here, maybe you run a company, you run a business. You know how important this quality is. If you don't get your work done, you'll get fired. If you have people working underneath you, and every time you give them an assignment and they never complete the assignment, you're frustrated with them. And you want to fire them. Or you want to put them on probation. Why is it that in the church oftentimes we just make allowances and excuses? When we've been given something, we see the task and the assignment to the finish line. I love when Jesus concludes his ministry here on earth. One of the last things that he said was what? It is finished. Aren't you thankful that Jesus finished his assignment? Right? It is finished. Here's the thing. God will not say to us, well started, well intended. He's going to say, well, well done. It's not well started, not well intended, not well spoken. It's well done. Um, here, here's, here's the thing that I know is that a lot of people in organizational leadership, they want promotion, but a lot of times they fail uh, to, to finish things that they've already been given, and they're looking for a promotion. And here's what I would say. Completion precedes promotion. It's like the things that we've been given, that we've been, we've been trusted and trusted with, that we see every task to completion. And it's in those moments, that's when it unlocks even greater promotion. I love what Jesus said in uh, John 17. He says, I have completed the assignment you gave me, Father. Now glorify your son. He didn't expect glory until he was finished with his assignment. I think it says something about us when we become people that say, I'm not going to be a person that makes excuses. I'm not going to be a person that, that just makes myself the victim of why I didn't do this. But I'm going to figure out, how do I get this done? You entrusted this to me. I said yes to the assignment. How do I get it done? There's a show, uh, I think it's called SEAL Team or Navy SEAL or something like that. I used to watch it. I don't really watch it anymore. But one of the things that the guy that led, his name was like, they call him like Alpha something, Alpha Bravo, blah, blah. I don't know how military stuff works. But it's a very cool show. And... Uh, they, they would always, every episode was the same. They hit a wall. Like, they, they run into a problem. And everybody freaks out. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And he's like, everybody, the leader, he's like, everybody, stop. Work the problem. That's all he was like, work the problem. Override. Like, he's like, there is a way. There's always a way. And guess what? Every single show, they figured out how to get it done. Why? Because their life depended on it. What would it look like as a leadership team and as leaders if we actually saw the assignments that God gives us and says, I've got to figure out 
how to work the problem, how to get it done, not make excuses, but complete the assignment that's been given to me. We get things done. I love what uh, the, the Apostle Paul said towards the end of his life. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. It's near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, and now. So I have finished, and now on the other side of my completion of the assignment that was entrusted to me, he says in Acts, I was faithful and obedient to the vision that God gave me. He says this, and now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, of which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Here's what I'm trying to say is like, the more reliable you are in any space as a leader that you serve and you occupy, occupy when people know that if I give this to them, it's as good as done, there will always be space for a leader in an organization like that. There will always be space for someone on a team that, that when a leader knows, man, if I give this to her, I don't even have to think about it again. I know she's going to crush this. I know the assignment's going to be done. Uh, I'll illustrate it with this, and I'll move to the next point. But I've got a friend, Cole and I, one of our good friends, the guy's name is Nathan Boley. He, uh, he's from Dothan, Alabama, the peanut capital of the world. <laughs> like five of you laughed at that. I wanted to burst out laughing when I just said that, okay? The peanut capital of the world. Can anything good come out of Dothan, right? And Nathan went to Church of the Highlands, Highlands College. He, he you know, if you see the guy back then, you'd be like, just looks like a little nerdy kid, you know, from Dothan with a, with a real strong southern draw. Then he says yes to go to San Francisco to plant a church. No money, no network, no connections. He asked me, and some of these Church of the Highlands kids asked me, they said, hey, so tell me about the internship in San Francisco, what you guys have, uh, you know, for interns and to come and intern with the church. I said, here's your internship. You got to find your own place to live and you got to find a job, work the, most, work the least amount of time, make the most amount of money, create margin for ministry. And if you can survive, you're in the internship. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. They were like, there's not a chapel service where we're going to do devotions. I was like, no, figure it out. Work the problem. <clears throat> well, Nathan worked the problem. Nathan got to San Francisco. First job was at Starbucks, worked there for a while. Then he, I think he went on staff maybe at Facebook or another place before that, then Facebook. He was there at Facebook for a while. Then he's been at a company called uh, CZI, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And he served within the church. And I watched him, I've watched him uh, through every company that he's been a part of. And now he's co-founder with me for our company. But every company he's been a part of and every church space that I've watched him, he hasn't been perfect. But here's one, the, probably the number one character trait that he has that has made him an irreplaceable player on every team that he served on is done. Everyone knows that if I give this to Nathan, he will get it done. It's an unbelievable quality to have when you're on someone's team. Well done, good. Somebody say good. good. I am running out of time, so I'm going to fly through these good. Everything that has been done can be undone if you fail to have good character. Good speaks to your character as a leader. Doesn't matter if, you, if you're excellent. Doesn't matter if you can get it done. If you don't have good character, as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a, as a man or woman leading a company, as an elder in the church, as a lead pastor, it doesn't matter if you get things done. If you fail to have good character, everything that's been done can be undone. Titus chapter 1 says this, a church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. It doesn't say flawless. See, flawless is about perfection, but blameless is about integrity. You see, a lot of times when people talk about integrity, they automatically think, well, that means that they're without sin and they're perfect. That's not true. Integrity comes from the word integer, right? It means one. It means whole. There's not divided parts. There's not, multi there's not duplicity. It's just one. In other words, watch. A leader with integrity in the church, they're not one way on the platform and another way in the streets. 
They're not one way when they're in front of other church people and another way somewhere else. No, there's, there's integrity. They're one. They're the same person everywhere. And they're doing their best to live a blameless life, like it says in Titus, which is what? You're living above reproach. So the question as a church leader is not, is this the right thing or the wrong thing to do? But is, is this the wise thing for me to do? In light of my past experiences, my present circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, is this the wise thing for me to do as a leader so I can live with integrity and to live a blameless life? life. When you, when you don't have character, everything that's been done can be undone. I remember this point being illustrated when I was in seminary, and I don't necessarily agree with this uh, philosophy of communication, but it marked me, and I remember it. I was 22 years old. I was at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and uh, it was a class on preaching. Dr. Stephen Trammell was my professor, and he had 20 of us in the classroom. He said, I'm going to teach you how to grade a sermon. And he taught us in, like, content and introduction and delivery and, and humor and all these different things and, like, things that you got to think through as a person communicating. And he said, I'm going to teach you how to score it. And then he turned out the lights and he played a video from that denomination of, of a guy preaching a sermon. And I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. It was remarkable. He turns the lights on and he goes, all right, on the whiteboard, first category, across the room, what did you give him for whatever that first category was? Introduction. 10, 10, so it was 1 out of 10, 10, 10, 10, maybe a 9, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Goes to the second category, third category, goes all the way through everything, and it was almost every category was a 10. And so he wrote flawless on the top. And we're like, that, there's no greater sermon. He turns the lights off. He plays another video, and it was from the same denomination. It was a news report that came out that week. The week that flawless sermon was preached by this preacher. News came out that that pastor was in multiple affairs during the same time he preached that sermon. He turned the lights on. He walked up to the board with a red marker. He drew a line through flawless, and he wrote disqualified. I'll never forget that. And he looked at me, and he looked at all those the students. He said, listen, I don't care how good you ever can preach. If you don't have good character, it doesn't matter at all. Everything that's been done can be undone if we fail to have good character. Faithful, and I'll just briefly touch on this and wrap up. Faithful is this, is that everything that we've been given is a test to see if we can be given more. This probably captures the heart of the entire, the entire thought, so I won't, I won't belabor this. But I'll just tell you this, that whatever you're currently doing in leadership and serving in this church, in your company, in your organization outside of here, it may be a test from whoever's overseeing you, but I can tell you this. I know this for sure. It's 100% a test from the Lord. And it's a test because he wants to give you more. Matthew 25, when they pass the test, what does he say? You've been faithful with a little. Here's more. God wants to give you more opportunity than you can ever imagine right now. God wants to give you more influence. God wants to give you more, more open doors. God wants to give you more opportunities to make an impact on people's lives. God, I would even submit to you, I, I believe God wants to even uh, maybe promote you in your job. God wants to bless you financially and all, but uh, God cannot trust someone that's never been tested. See, a leader that's never been tested cannot be trusted. And so what you currently have, what's in your hand, is God saying, I, want, I have all this in my heart, God says, that I want to give to you. But if you're not a good steward, I cannot entrust that because you will squander that which I give to you. So everything that you currently have, the people in your small group that you're leading, the people on your team that you're leading, the task or the assignments that you have, the resources that you've been entrusted with to budget and to steward, it's all a test because God wants to give you more. He's not a hard master. Think about the Matthew 25 text. The wicked, lazy, lazy servant, the way his perspective of his master was this. You're hard on people. You're just so hard on people. But the other two guys, it wasn't, they, they didn't see the master like that. They were like, what an opportunity we've been given. Man, you know what we want to do? We want to double this. We want to be faithful. We want to be fruitful. And then we want to give it back to our master because we find fulfillment in bringing him pleasure and joy. And then they're given more. What an incredible way to live our life to say, God's not a hard master. He's actually a loving father. And like any loving father, he wants to give his kids amazing gifts. I want to give my kids 13, 10, and four, two boys and a little girl. I want to give these kids anything they could possibly imagine. 
But whenever I show up in the bonus room and they got trash all over the room, they got the TV's got a crack in it that I just bought. They got, I mean, I look at them, I'm like, boys, because you know that's not the girl, it's the boys. <laughs> I said, I can't trust you with nothing. If you only knew what I wanted to give you, now I'm taking everything that was yours and I'm giving it to Novi. You know, I don't do that. They'll, they'll need some serious counseling. But the point is, the point is like a good father, good mother, what's in their heart for their kids? Man, they want to give them everything. But a, a bad parent is one that just keeps, you know, when they say prodigal son, you know, it's not actually in, in the text. It's actually, it's, if you study it, it's actually, prodigal means wasteful. The passage is not about the son. The passage is actually about the father. And the father is seen as prodigal, like he's wasting this on his son. That's what people think, right? But, but I'm telling you that to say that like a good parent is not wasteful. A good parent stewards well and watches, can this person, can this kid be trusted? God's the same way. It's just normal. Last one is this, is servant. Everything that we do, uh, we do as a servant. Well done, good, faithful servant. Servant. I, I love that it ends on that, servant. Because it always comes back to this, doesn't it? It doesn't matter if I'm standing up here with a microphone or if in 2000, whenever I told my youth pastor, I said, man, I feel like I'm called to preach. He said, you feel like you're called to preach? I said, I feel like I'm called to preach. He said, okay, uh, there's a broom back there and I want you to sweep when everyone leaves. And I was like, I don't think you heard me. I feel called to preach. I feel called to rock a mic. And he said, you'll never rock a mic unless you can first rock a broom. Go pick up that broom and start sweeping, right? And in 2000, it was about serving. And guess what it's still about today? It's about serving. It doesn't change. Like, I'm not a professional pastor now. <laughs> it always comes back to serving. So if you start within an organization, let's just put it outside of somewhere. You start within an organization and you just get in at the bottom level and you keep rising in layers of leadership. If you now see that you're in that place and everyone under you is serving you, you've missed the point. Flip that org chart upside down. God has now put you in a position to now serve them. Isn't that what happened with Joseph? He rises to second in command and he saw, I have been brought to this place. I've walked through hell to get here, but I've been brought to this place. Why? So that many could be saved. I'm here to serve people. It's not about the position. It's not about the title. It's not about the role. It's about the goal of loving and serving people. It always comes back to serving. Listen, if you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. And if serving is beneath you, then leading is beyond you. It always comes back to one thing, what Jesus modeled for us in John 13. We stoop to greatness in leadership and we wash people's feet. It's a picture of serving. Jesus said, even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for, for many. It always comes back to serving. Doesn't seem that sexy. Doesn't seem that glamorous. Yeah, I, I just wanna serve. No, no, don't you want to just make a big difference? I, I'm just here to serve. Be faithful with what God has given me. Well done, good, faithful servant. I'll finish with this final remark. There was a young man. I want, I want to put this picture on the, on the screen. Jordan Gotro. Um, you have that picture? This guy right here. Look at that, that look on his face. It looks like a werewolf with a big old beard. And his beard would grow out to like right here. I'd been mentoring this guy. He was one of Cole's friends. Uh, grew up in our youth ministry and uh, was a phenomenal athlete. Uh, just love the Lord. He was valedictorian of his, of his class. He got up at this public school and he preached the gospel for his, his, his final word there. Preached, just loved to serve people. Could have, could have gotten a scholarship to play basketball in a lot of different places, but he said, I feel called to serve and to give my life to build the, build the kingdom and to serve the local church. So he went through our school of ministry at Healing Place Church, began to serve. And uh, I, I saw a call of God on this, this kid's life. Like, man, I think he's the successor for me in the youth pastor role. So begin to mentor him and pour into him. He came on staff and was serving and was helping with our, our student ministry. And then in 2000, I guess it was 2008 or nine, whenever the economy crashed, we had a staff of probably 120, 130, and uh, we had to let a lot of people go. And it was just a tough time for a lot of people, right? And um, so one of the things is we were, we were trying to cut expenses. We, it was a big 120,000 foot building or square foot building, big facility. And we had a company, an agency that would clean it. Well, we had to cut that. And so then we had to reposition some of our staff to start cleaning the buildings and doing all, all the facilities. 
And so I remember my pastor, Pastor Dino, calling me and saying, hey, we got a, your staff's going to be cut in half, and I need to take these people, and we, we just need them for a season to start serving in facilities. And Jordan was one of those guys. So he went from, like, preaching every couple Wednesdays or emceeing the service, very public kind of, you know, uh, to the next Monday. He's tra changing trash liners for all the staff, people that were his peers. He's now changing the trash liners. He's mopping, cleaning toilets and the whole thing, cleaning windows. And uh, that became his new assignment. And I used to always tell him, hey, it's, not, it's easy to preach this. It's hard to live it. It's not about the role, remember? It's about the goal. It's not about the role. It's about the goal. He's like, I got it, Pastor Jason. I got it, Pastor Jason. Probably rolled his eyes a little bit. But, uh, man, he just said, I just want to make a difference. I don't care. I'm here to serve. And so he started not only doing, he was taking care of facilities, but Sunday mornings he would set up stuff for one of our locations. Then he'd go to our, our Baton Rouge Dream Center. He'd serve there, a very impoverished community. He would serve there. Then the Sunday afternoons he'd go to a retirement community and he would preach there. He's like, man, Pastor Jason, I think I'm going to see more people uh, come to faith in Christ and go to heaven. He goes, because they're about to meet Jesus. So I kind of have a captive audience and they're ready. <laughs> they're ready. So he would, he would go and he would serve there. And then uh, Mondays and Tuesdays, he would be leading small groups. Wednesday, he would set up for our youth ministry. I'd walk in there on Wednesday, Wednesdays before service. He had a, a backpack uh, vacuum cleaner and he was just going around there with uh, his little earbuds and he's just like cleaning and everything. And uh, he would lead uh, our, co our college ministry on Thursday. Thursday morning, he would go, we'd feed 120 homeless people. He was there serving. I mean, this guy just was all over the place serving. He was serving so much, he pretty much wore this red serve team shirt every day. I mean, I can't think of how many times he wasn't wearing this red serve team shirt. It was like he was known in our church as the guy with the red serve team shirt. And in 2010, um, I was away with Pastor Dino on a ministry trip, and we get this phone call that, uh, this was on Sunday morning before the 9 a.m. service. He was putting out signs directing people into uh, d directing traffic off the road into the church. And someone lost control of their car. They struck him and they killed him tragically. And, you know, I, th I thought about that because that week, earlier that week, I walk into the youth room and he's in there with his vacuum cleaner backpack on, vacuuming, and I could see he had tears in his eyes. I, I sat down with him and I said, uh, Jordan, what's going on, man? He was like, Pastor Jason, he goes, I've had it in my heart to be a pastor and to make a big difference for a long time. He goes, and now it just feels like I'm taking steps backwards. He goes, I'm just, I'm cleaning, I'm doing these small things. And he was like, I just, I don't know if I'm really making a difference. And he said, uh, these huge tears streaming down his face, he said, I just want to hear him say, well done, good, faithful servant. I said, Jordan, you're going to hear him say that, man? I said, you're doing a great job. I said, Jordan, you're making a bigger difference than you can ever imagine. And then that Sunday, his life is cut short, 22 years old. But do you know that at his funeral, there were thousands of people in the room all wearing red serve shirts. There were over five to 6,000 people outside of, of even the states that were watching, streaming his funeral service. And there was a statement that was said about him as a servant at his funeral. They said, life is not measured in its duration, but in its donation. So let's keep serving people. Well done, good, faithful servant. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you so much. And God, kind of what's in my heart right now in this moment, I just sense that there's maybe some folks that feel like, man, I'm just doing some small things. I'm not really making that big of a difference. But the reality is, is that I think, I think they're making a bigger difference than what they could ever imagine. Encourage them to just stay faithful, to keep plowing forward, to keep doing this all for an audience of one. It's just about you, Jesus. We just wanna love people, serve people. We wanna build your kingdom as you build your church. We wanna do it at a, a place of rest and a, a rhythm that is sustainable. And God, our, our heart's desire is to hear you say, well done, good, faithful servant. We want to have a spirit of excellence. We want to execute on the assignments we've been entrusted with, and we want to get things done. And God, we, we want to have good, good character. We want to have integrity. We want to be faithful. God, ultimately, it all comes down to just one thing. We feel so honored and blessed to get to serve in your kingdom. Thank you for choosing us. We did not choose you. You chose us. We did not choose the ministry. You chose for us to be partners with you in the ministry. 
thank you for Soma Church and how you're using this phenomenal core team to make a great difference. In Jesus' name, amen.